Um, so, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Julia De Bruyne and I'm a um, Senior Fellow in Food Systems and Nutrition at the Natural Resources Institute. I'd like to um, welcome you all to our, our conference session today on Food Systems for Improved Nutrition. Um, this is the second of a series of events we're running this week as part of our uh, Food and Nutrition Security Initiative, um, which we often refer to as FANCY. Um, so many people on this call might be familiar with the FANCY program. Uh, it's a, a three-year uh, block of funding which was awarded by Research England um, in mid-2019. And um, the, the funding is being used for a quite substantial expansion of, of staff at NRI, as well as um, a series of PhD students, infrastructure, and also building our partnerships. Um, so the FANCY program is, is focused around uh, systems-based and interdisciplinary strategies for um, enhancing food and nutrition security with a particular focus on Africa. Um, we um, have this work most directly focused on four uh, programs of our work, um, but we recognise that this is a theme that cuts across um, many or all of the uh, bodies of work within NRI. Um, so today's session is focused around the Food Systems for Improved Nutrition Program, which I coordinate. And we've, we've taken the opportunity to also highlight the uh, Gender and Social Difference Program, which uh, Laura Forsyth, who you'll be hearing from later, uh, leads. Um, so part of FANCY is about uh, building on partnerships, which are quite long-standing with um, a number of African universities, um, also a series of international research institutes that NRI has a long history of working with, um, including several of the CG centres, uh, as well as a couple of UK-based research institutes. So through FANCY, we're building and consolidating these partnerships, but also seeking to um, expand and um, develop new partnerships. So um, today we'll be speaking quite a lot about food sy systems and um, a fair bit about frameworks. So um, this is one example of a food systems framework, which many people are perhaps familiar with. Uh, this is kind of the latest derivation, um, but uh, this one's from the high-level panel of experts report from last year, but it's uh, building on a, an earlier report from uh, 2017. I'm not quite sure of all the people we have in, on this call, so I thought I'd start by just highlighting some of the dimensions of a, a food systems framework. Um, often when we think about food systems, we think first about food production systems. And this has been a, um, a large focus of work at NRI uh, for many years around uh, sustainable agricultural intensification, food loss and waste. Uh, there's a session on food loss and waste tomorrow, which some of you might be attending. Um, and often we think about food supply chains or food value chains. We think about activities that go from production through to consumption. Um, more recently, there's been a rise in thinking about the contexts which mediate this sort of acquisition and consumption of food. Um, several of our panel members will be speaking about food environments a little bit later on. Um, in this program, we focus particularly on nutrition outcomes of food systems, but we also recognise the uh, outcomes to be much broader in terms of uh, environmental, social equity and economic impacts. So when we think about food systems through the course of today's session more broadly, we're trying to sort of capture the interconnected nature of many of these dimensions and um, activities. Um, one uh, development with this recent report has been thinking about the other systems which impact on food systems. And we also think about the drivers that enable, uh, inhibit or influence change within all of these activities and um, components. We think about entry points for policy and governance to uh, influence outcomes, um, as well as issues around food security and the right to food, which underpin um, all of these many aspects. So um, to get a bit of a feel for the people that we have with us in today's workshop, um, I thought it'd be nice to have a few Mentimeter slides. So um, I'll ask you to... Um, if you have access to a um, phone or your computer that you can use to 
give us a bit of a feel for your background. Um, we're first interested in what countries people might have conducted work on about different aspects of food systems or nutrition. So I invite you to um, go to menti.com um, on one of your devices and if you can type in the code, um, you'll have the opportunity to list a series of countries that you might have conducted uh, research in um, on some or all aspects that we've presented in the previous slide. Appreciate we probably have people that have worked across more than five countries, but perhaps you can indicate to us um, the kind of larger focus of your work. A few countries popping up. So within um, Fancy, as I mentioned, we have a, um, a principal focus on countries of, of Africa, um, but NRI as an institute works much more broadly um, across many sitting, uh, settings. We can see here quite a mix coming up. Um, and some of these countries will be profiled in presentations later on today. Um, interestingly, we see um, the UK, can't see where it's popped to now, um, just down below is, is um, represented by relatively few people um, on this call so far. Um, one thing which uh, Chris might highlight later on is um, a new initiative we have within NRI uh, where we're leading a, a centre for doctoral training around UK-based food systems. So I think it'll be less of a focus of our, um, of our workshop today, but something that we're um, kind of developing a future work in as well. And um, moving on to... Oh, a uh, second question, um, we recognise from, from figures like uh, the food systems framework that um, many academic disciplines and many professional areas are represented within uh, this area of work. So I'd invite you to um, capture your kind of area of work in a few words, um, whether that be an academic discipline, you know that many of us are multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary researchers, um, we might also have people joining us from a professional background. If you're anything like me, you might find it a bit challenging to um, describe yourself in a, a few words. But um, to see geography I'm featuring there. We're seeing quite a nice um, cross-section of skills within our group. Um, as our session goes on, you'll see that um, within our panels, we've got quite diverse um, representation. I think um, Laura, who's leading the second panel, will be quite happy to see um, gender prominently um, at the centre of our, um, our session on food systems for nutrition. So it's really nice to see such a cross section. So we will um, just shift back to my other presentation. And to give you a bit of an outline of our session today. So, um, so we, as I mentioned, we've got a couple of themes that we'll be um, approaching through today's session um, through a, a couple of panels. So our first theme is focused around um, sort of bridging concepts and practice when it comes to, to food systems and nutrition. Um, so my colleague Chris Turner will be leading this panel. So we'll have a series of uh, lightning talks, uh, just very short five minute presentations from panel members, um, both internal and um, external to NRI, uh, a series of uh, questions. So I'll invite you to submit questions through our chat and we'll post those to our panel members. We'll have a short 10 minute break and then move on to a second panel. Um, so again, some short presentations and an opportunity for questions. Um, this panel is led by Laura Forsyth. And then the last part of our session, we'll have a chance to break into groups and um, reflect on some of these presentations, share 
um, our own perspectives and identify some of the key issues in this space. So um, I'd like to now pass to Chris, um, who's going to um, take over to introduce our, um, our first panel. Brilliant, great. Uh, thanks, Julia. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Chris Turner. I'm a research fellow in food systems and public health nutrition at NRI. And today I have the pleasure of chairing this exciting panel session on food system actions for improved nutrition with a focus on concepts and practice. We've got a great panel of speakers lined up today to share their knowledge and expertise. So we have uh, Shilpa Constantinidis from the Drivers of Food Choice Program from the University of South Carolina. We have Dominic Rowland from the Action Against Stunting Hub, LSH Chairman SOAS, as well as the University of London. We have Joyce Kinabo from Sakoyan University of Agriculture and the Tanzania Food and Nutrition Center and Delia Randolph from our very own NRI. So as Julie mentioned, I'd like just to start by um, giving a brief presentation or brief overview of this theme uh, to set the scene uh, for our panel members. So I realize this uh, is, is perhaps um, common knowledge to everybody so who's here, we're all quite well versed in some of these, but it would be nice just to give an overview. So how do we define the food system? This is clearly a challenge given the broad scope, but the high level panel of experts did a really great job in 2014 when they note that the food system gathers all of the elements and activities that relate to the production, processing, distribution, preparation and consumption of food, as well as the output of these activities, including socioeconomic and environmental outcomes. It's worth noting that the elements that they refer to include the environment, people, inputs, processes, infrastructures and institutions. If we refer to the diagram on the left hand side here, we can see that the Centre for Food Policy at City University identified five key themes around the food system. And these include health, politics, economy, society and environment. They're clearly overlapping and they interrelate with each other. Um, as you can see, they've picked out a number of different aspects uh, within each of these different themes. Um, and as you can see, it's quite a complex web. Um, some of the uh, frameworks we're going to come on to look at later have taken slightly different approaches to this. Um, so I think it might be interesting to, uh, to sort of reflect upon that and, and the different ways of representing uh, the food system. So I also thought it might just be worth to present a little bit of a potted history of food systems agenda, um, trying to sort of cover the last 60 years or so in one slide here. But um, the early literature from the 60s and the 70s typically focused on production and distribution uh, in response to the food, food security crises of the time. Um, since then, there has been progressive shifts towards more holistic concepts of the food system. This framework on the left-hand side here by Sobo Khan and Bissoni et al. Uh, from 1998 uh, is one of the first food system uh, frameworks. They actually termed it, termed it the food and nutrition system. Um, here you can see that they depicted the resources which feed into producers, consumers, nutrition and health and the interactions between them, as well as the, they also note the contribution of biophysical and social environments. More recently, we've seen shifts uh, in focus from undernutrition to all forms of malnutrition. I'm sure we're all aware of that. And we're currently um, in what I've termed here the, in the food systems transformation era, um, aiming to improve food and nutrition security to achieve sustainable development agenda for 2030. And this re really reflects the recognition um, that food systems are failing to support diets that are nutritious, healthy, and sustainable. And I'm sure we've all seen, uh, you know, the idea of food system transformation across funding, funding uh, bodies and policies and documents, um, as well as, uh, as research itself. So we've also seen increasing recognition of the concept of the food environment as an interface within the wider food system. And here are just a couple of reports from recent years from 2017 onwards that feature the food environment quite heavily um, as a key component of the food system. Here's a conceptual framework that I published with colleagues from the ANH Academy uh, Food Environment Working Group. Um, here we sought to depict the food environment as this interface or this white box uh, within the wider food system. So we identified the external food environment domain, which contains dimensions such as food availability, prices, vendor and product properties, and marketing and regulation. So that's very much the world of opportunities and constraints that are out there, if you like. We also identified the personal food environment domain including dimensions such as food accessibility, affordability, convenience, and desirability. So very much dimensions that are relative to individuals. Interactions between these domains and dimensions are what we consider to shape food acquisition and consumption in relation to the food environment. And these interactions may be vertical within the domains, 
It may be horizontal across the domains or indeed both. It's also worth noting that the importance of the various domains and dimensions are likely to be different across different contexts and also amongst different people, even within the same setting. So some of these concepts have been adapted, for example, by UNICEF and GAIN in 2019 as part of their food systems for children and adolescents framework. As you can see here, the uh, external and personal food environment domains have been complemented with aspects of food supply chains, as well as the behaviors of caregivers, children and adolescents as key determinants of uh, child and adolescent diets. So as Julie mentioned, the high-level panel of experts have also made significant contributions in recent years, such as this example from 2017, uh, which recognizes the importance of food supply chains, food environments, consumer behaviors, uh, to diets and nutrition and health outcomes, as well as a series of impacts. Um, you'll also note the introduction of the SDGs there at the bottom, as well as three out of the four pillars of food security at the bottom, uh, as it was currently defined at the time. Um, so you can really start to see this evolution of ideas uh, and concepts. So this framework was uh, refined and developed and published in 2020 recently, um, again, um, sort of developing these concepts and we have uh, the addition of um, food systems uh, and as well as supporting systems for food production. And you can see that in the box to the very left hand side here. And again, uh, as Julia showed earlier, and this is just really reflecting that the food system is, is one system that relates with a, a range of other systems too. Another key development here is the inclusion of the right to food framework, uh, which underpins the framework at the bottom, uh, as well as an expanded definition of food security. And this is just something that I think uh, is just worth uh, reflecting upon because uh, the sort of concepts of food security, have more or less, uh, although there have been sort of developments in the definition, the actual um, pillars of food security themselves have been relatively stable over the past two to three decades. But recently we've seen a shift towards including uh, agency as well as sustainability uh, in, into the definition and, and the pillars of food security. So again, reflecting this change uh, in the agenda, thinking about dimensions of sustainability, but also uh, how we might engage people um, to effect change and transform the food system through their agency. So before we go to the panel, um, I just thought I'd close with a couple of rhetorical questions. So first, why conceptualize the food system? Well, food system concepts can help describe the conflict, complex phenomena that we're, we're looking to study. They can help build a cohesive research agenda and also guide research practice, particularly the design and implement, implementation of research projects, as well as methods and metrics. And some of our panel presentations today are gonna to touch on some of these topics. They can also help us to identify entry points for targeted interventions and provide a framework to map and disseminate data and findings. To the left-hand side here, we have the Food Systems Dashboard um, by Jess Fanzo and colleagues. Um, and here they've adapted the high-level panel of experts, most recent framework uh, to an online platform, which maps uh, a, a range of data sets. So if you've not seen that, I'd encourage you to go and just take a look and have a click around because it's kind of interesting to see what data is out there. Um, it just shows how we can use these frameworks uh, uh, to disseminate data uh, and research findings. Um, so the second question really was, how, what are the key challenges in conceptualizing food systems? Um, clearly there are challenges in representing the complex phenomena in a clear and coherent way. Um, sometimes the complicated or abstract concepts and technical terminology may present barriers to uptake or engagement with practitioners um, and sort of our, our research participants. And I think this is something that Joyce and perhaps Delia are gonna to speak to in their presentations. Another challenge is reflecting the rapidly evolving and diverse food systems agenda. Um, uh, clearly, I didn't have time today to present all of the frameworks from the past sort of 20 years. But if you do look into the literature, you'll see every two to three years, there is an evolving set of concepts. Um, and every time you sort of codify or publish a framework, um, it almost acts as like a timestamp in reflecting uh, the agenda at that time. Um, so clearly, it's quite difficult to keep abreast and to, to sort of look forward in terms of um, at what might be around the corner. Another key challenge is integrating and, and capturing concepts from multiple disciplines um, and also uh, different research themes uh, within food systems research. This is something that I think Shilpa is gonna touch on in her presentation from her work mapping uh, the drivers of food choice projects. Um, and finally, uh, another key challenge is operationalizing these concepts into methods and metrics. And this is something that I think Dominic's gonna speak about in his presentation. 
So that's all from me. Um, I'm now going to pass to Shilpa and she's going to talk about using a global food environment framework to understand relationships with food choice in diverse uh, low and middle income countries. So Shilpa, over to you and I'll stop sharing my slides now. Okay. Thank you. Let me try to share my screen. And when I do, can you let me know if you see my presentation or my, um, or my notes? One second. I can see your notes. Great, that looks great. Okay, so uh, hello. Thank you, Chris, for the introduction and thank you to Fancy for giving me this opportunity to share with you this work. Um, I am a research, research associate with the Drivers of Food Choice Competitive Grants Program at the University of South Carolina Arnold School of Public Health. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited to be here today to share with you our work on using a global food environment framework to understand these relationships with food choice in diverse low and middle income countries. And I'd like to thank the study team listed below here and the investigators that contributed their evidence and experiences to this work. So food environments are the physical, economic, political, and sociocultural context through which individuals interact with the food system to make choices about food, including how to acquire, store, prepare, distribute, and consume food. But food environments are rapidly changing in low and middle income countries due to urbanization, globalization, new technologies, climate change and migration, and interest is growing globally in understanding the drivers of food choice in these contexts to improve the dietary, nutrition, and health outcomes through policy and program action. So partially in response to that need, the Drivers of Food Choice Competitive Grants Program seeks to facilitate, synthesize, and disseminate research to provide a deep understanding of the drivers of food choice among the poor in developing countries. And the program funded 15 projects across 10 LMICs in Sub-Saharan Africa and South and Southeast Asia, as you can see on the map on the left. So Chris presented this uh, framework a second ago, so I won't go too much in, too much in depth, but as we know, frameworks can be useful in consistently aligning theoretical concepts and empirical research to help set research agendas and to inform targeted policies and interventions. And this framework they published in 2018, um, seeking to unpack the food environment as an interface within the wider food system. So like you said, they identified the external and the personal food environment domains, the external food environment domain referring to the exogenous opportunities and constraints that influence food choice, and the personal food environment referring to individual level influences on food choice. So using evidence from the DFC projects, we sought to determine whether this framework allows researchers in diverse LMIC settings to identify and study that interface between individual food choice and the food environment, and to identify existing gaps in the understanding of that interface in these settings that's represented in the framework. So we developed a data extraction matrix, which was populated by the principal investigators for each of the 15 projects. The data that we gathered included the study characteristics, food environment subdomains that were studied, um, outcomes studied. We asked them to provide empirical results on the relationship between food environment and food choice. And finally, the investigators provided free text reflections on the usefulness of the framework in describing that relationship and any characteristics of the food environment that they found missing from the framework. Using thematic analysis, we identified the common drivers of food choice within the food environment across countries, and we identified the emergent important characteristics that were not explicitly described in the framework. So on average, the investigators addressed five of the eight subdomains listed in the framework, suggesting that the domains of the subdomains were useful in operationalizing the concepts of the food environment in these studies of its relationship with food choice. And the drivers of food choice within the food environment most consistently found by investigators to be important in influencing food choice in their settings are highlighted with the blue arrow. And those were prices and affordability, availability and vendor and product properties specifically with respect to food safety and food quality. Um, marketing and regulation, accessibility, convenience and desirability were also found to be important but less consistently so across countries. The investigators also identified several characteristics of the food environment that were very important in their study context and are not explicitly listed in the framework, which we classified into five constructs. Perspectives of food safety, um, which includes the subjective and the experiential aspects of food safety as opposed to just objectively measured aspects of food safety. Social forces, gender dynamics, stability, and wider food system drivers. And these constructs differ from the existing subdomains and that four of them apply to both the external and the personal food environments. And the fifth construct of the wider food system drivers reaches beyond both domains of the food environment. 
Investigators found it difficult to classify the observations related to these contexts, these constructs, into the existing domains and subdomains of the food of the framework. And they considered them to be critical to understanding the relationship between food environment and food choice. So what we understood is that the framework provides the content necessary to synthesize understanding across the projects of common drivers of food choice within the food environment. But our results provided new insights on the five emergent constructs related to the food, envi of the, the food environment, four of which cut across the food environment domains. So we know that more consideration is needed in understanding how to represent these cross-cutting constructs in the future iterations of the framework, as well as how to include them in research and policy and program action aimed at improving food choice through the food environment. So we know that frameworks can play an important role in setting research and policy agendas, but they must be useful and responsive to diverse settings. And there must be continued iterative development of conceptual and empirical food environment research, as Chris talked about earlier, to more accurately inform these strategies to improve nutrition and health outcomes in LMICs and globally. And thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Shilpa, that was great. Um, so now we're going to move on quickly to Dom, and he's going to talk about his experiences of developing a, a food environment metric as part of the work, his work with the Stunting Hub. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, yeah, so uh, as Chris says, um, I'm from the Action Against Stunting Hub. Um, so this is a uh, transdisciplinary project with 18 institutions around the world that's focused on three different cohort studies, um, one in Kaffrey in Senegal, one in Hyderabad, India, and one in Lombok in Indonesia. And it's um, this particular presentation is, is part of the food systems team. Um, within that, we've got a food environment uh, team uh, led by Sunita Kadiala at um, LSHDM, and it's in collaboration with Imana and Drivers of Food Choice. And our aim in, in this team is to try and develop some kind of food environment metric um, where we can characterize the food environment with a particular purpose in mind, which is to, to identify potential levers within the food system that can be used in order to have policy level, policy interventions at the food system level to improve diets and nutrition, to reduce stunting. Um, and so we take as the starting point of this, of the food system, this conceptual framework you've already seen twice today, um, the Turner framework. And this sort of defines the scope of the food environment for us. And I'd like to talk a little bit about how we've gone about trying to develop a metric from this conceptual framework and some of the challenges that are involved in, in doing that. Um, so... When we think about developing this metric, um, it really comes down to, you can really summarize it by the why, what, and the how. So you need to take a lot of time. We needed to really think about what the purpose is. The, the conceptual frameworks are extremely broad and extremely complex, um, and you can't measure everything, and you don't necessarily want to measure everything. So you really need to focus on what, what is the purpose? Are you doing it for? characterizing the food environment? Are you doing it for a policy intervention? Are you doing it for monitoring or surveillance or identifying a particular thing? You know, um, and then when you've got that purpose, you need to work out, well, what exactly is it that we're measuring? Are we measuring values or preferences? Are we measuring behavior? Are we measuring attitudes? And then, then you need to identify what, what are the methods that you can best get at what that thing is. So um, I'm just using that sort of why, but for us, it was because the, the objective was to produce something that was useful for policymakers and researchers in suggesting areas of the food system that can be changed with the result in improved diet. So there was target was policymakers. We wanted a subpopulation level kind of metric. So we wanted to be able to characterize the food environment, but we also wanted to recognize that people had different food environments depending on their livelihoods and their activity spaces. So we wanted to be able to compare subpopulations within a particular location. And we took the constructs and properties from the Turner framework and from our informative research and literature reviews. Um, but we wanted to focus most, we want to prioritize those that can be measured and also those that can be influenced. So there's lots of things within the framework um, that, that we can't either, either measure very well or it's very hard to measure um, or can't be influenced through a food system level intervention. 
Um, so this is just a schematic that shows sort of all the numerous different ways you could go down. This is only a few of them. Um, so you need to think about things like, uh, do you want to do group level? Do you want group level interventions? Do you want individual level data? Do you want to look at exposures? Do you want to look at values or preferences? Um, what are the purposes is it for monitoring and surveillance? Is it exposure? Is it perceptions? This kind of thing. Um, and so for us, we, going back to the framework, we, the interaction between the personal and the external was the bit that we were interested in. And the way that we came up with identifying that interaction space was on the experience. So the experience is the bit where the external meets the personal. Um, and implicit within that is a causal framework, um, which is that exposure to food environments is in somehow some way a determinant of dietary outcomes. But we also needed to make sure that we understood and recognized that there was a complex and often reverse causality between exposure and outcomes here. Um, and that there were trade-offs between different priorities and different constraints. And, and as I say, we excluded a lot of things that are important within this that can't either be measured or that weren't the focus, such as values and preferences and food choice decision making. Um, and then when you get down to the methods of how do we go about measuring what we're trying to get at, there are lots of great methods, lots of different studies being done on the food environments. Um, and we decided to focus on a survey instrument, mainly because we wanted to sort of this balance between scale and contextual understanding. We wanted something that could be used in a variety of const context that could be quantified subdomains and used to compare different um, contexts. Um, and we wanted this activity-based approach, which means we have to go down to the individual level um, in order to focus on these trade-offs and constraints. Um, and this is just a summary of uh, the food environment metric as it stands. It's still in a prototype stage. And just to, to finish up with just some reflections on using conceptual frameworks to develop metrics. Um, these conceptual frameworks, they're, they're absolutely vital for defining the scope, right? And, and for highlighting complexity. And it's far more than this list of constructs and the interaction between the constructs is extremely important. But there are also challenges of turning that into a metric because conceptual frameworks often are best when they are multidimensional and have different scales, but um, the metrics really need to be unidimensional because you don't want to be tapping into some other property or aspect when you're measuring one thing rather than the other. So, um, you know, we're trying to tap into unidimensional latent constructs. You have to be very specific about what that is and what the causal mechanism is in mind. Um, and there's also huge dangers of developing metrics from conceptual frameworks is that you don't want the metric to become the definition. And that's, I think, a really valuable role that the conceptual frameworks can play, which is broadening it out and keeping in account the context and the full situation and not just relying on the metrics to define the topic. So um, I'm a bit over time, so I'll finish there. Thank you very much. No, that's brilliant. Thanks, Tom. That was really great. Um, we're now going to move on quickly. I'm going to save all the sort of comments and questions to the end. We're going to move on quickly uh, to a presentation from Joyce. And if I've understood correctly, Joyce, I think you want me to share uh, your slides. So I'll do that from my end. If you could just let me know when you want me to change slide, that'd be brilliant. Um, so I'll just do that now and then uh, we'll get going. Here in Tanzania. Uh, so next slide, please. Basically, the definition is very clear and everybody has uh, said it, but uh, I would like to draw your attention to the uh, determinants or activities of food systems and food environment, which in our situation, I think they tend to, to vary according to settings. Um, in some other areas, it's very difficult to really draw a line between a rural setting and urban setting. But in our kind of situation, we have really straight, like a line dividing rural settings. So you can see that in rural settings, we have predominantly people who depend on their own production and limited access to markets. In urban areas, we have basically people who are access food through markets and limited on production. So these differences call for our, having conceptual frameworks that address 
these differences. Most of the uh, conceptual formats seem to be like uh, one size fits all, and in some situation that cannot work. We need also to remember that um, there's migration of food systems and food environment in either direction, rural setting or urban setting. So that aspect also has to be taken into consideration. And what we've seen in the study that we did here in Tanzania about food environment, there is some interaction between food environment and food system. And in some way it tends to affect the way people uh, access or utilize the food that is available in the, in the area. So you can see that apart from the rural and urban setting, next slide please, we also have differences in terms of eco agroecological zones or ag agroecological pre predisposition. And this is very pronounced in our settings. So we have agroecological zones that seem to vary from one area to another. So basically the conceptual frameworks that are existing right now cannot really capture all the variations that we see in our situation. So in this regard, I would recommend probably that development of conceptual frameworks should work, take into consideration the context. I know uh, some presenters have already alluded to that, but should also involve people who are participating in a particular food system to identify key elements to include in a conceptual framework. Because what we see right now is this conceptual frameworks originating from somewhere else and people have to figure out how to deal with the situation. But again, I think it would be uh, wise to actually probably come with a generic one where people can actually feed in, in some of the information that they want to, to, to do. But again, what I would imagine, I'm glad to hear that there's, there's a conceptual framework that is looking exactly on stunting. Uh, so the focus should be human well-being or improving health by reducing problems such as stunting, overweight, obesity, NCDs, and things like that. Next slide, please. So this sometimes is not very explicit in the conceptual frameworks. So these are the conditions that people know about them, the experience they identify with on a daily basis. So it would be easier for people to act on some of the conceptual framework once they know that they are part of that process. Um, I've looked uh, into some of the conceptual frameworks and they refer to food security or poverty reduction or nutrition uh, improvement. Uh, to many implementers, these are far-fetched kind of uh, goals, uh, especially for people who are in, involved in implementation of programs. For example, if I take poverty reduction, it's a huge undertaking and cannot be challenged by improving food system alone. So we see that poverty is about is political, is structural. So we need to be really down to earth to levels that implementers and beneficiaries would be able to understand. And we don't want these conceptual frameworks to remain at that high level. I think it has to be brought down to the levels where action can actually take place and we, we see changes happening in those uh, uh, societies. Next slide, please. So basically we need to be asking ourselves what food systems or food environment would help to reduce stunting or overweight or obesity or NCDs. Uh, basically, um, the food system approach calls for multidisciplinary, uh, but that would tend to require a common understanding of the elements of the conceptual frameworks by all people participating. Uh, we, what we observed in our study about food environment, because we involved um, like nutrition, a committee that brings in uh, people from various disciplines. And many of them are not aware of what is going on. And uh, it's very difficult to bring these people on board if they don't understand what is uh, involved. And the silo mode is still going on and there's no way that we're gonna change it today or tomorrow. So um, I was glad to hear that you're starting a, a program that will be teaching about food systems. This is something that uh, is 
welcome. And education and training programs, as we know, the way we conduct uh, training and education, we still have to embrace the concept of multidisciplinarity or holistic approach uh, based on needs or problems affecting various population in different settings. So this also has to be considered and I don't know how that can be brought into uh, the training and education programs, but it's something that we need to really take into account. But I would like to go also for research agendas that are developed by funding of agencies or countries or international organizations to consider this aspect of food system or holistic approach to issues instead of just picking one point and uh, leaving everything else for somebody else to do. So again, in our countries, we don't have like institutional framework to accommodate the food system approach or even holistic approach. And this is actually very difficult when it comes to policy implications that are identified during research. You don't know exactly where to direct some of these observations so that action can be taken. I think this is all what I had to share with you and thank you very much for that opportunity. Thank you. Thanks Joyce, that was really great. Um, so now we're going to move on uh, quickly to uh, Delia Randolph, who I think is going to provide uh, some evidence from some case studies uh, from her own research. Can you see the, the, the um, PowerPoint? Yeah, that looks great. Great. Very glad to be with you all and to be with NRI. Uh, I'm aware time is, is flying, so I'll give you just a quick run through some aspects of uh, food safety. So those were a very interesting discussion on um, conceptual frameworks. And of course in health, oh, my, my slides are not advancing. In health, we also have conceptual frameworks. Um, for some reason, my slides are not advancing. You wanna try and open it and close yeah. it again? Oh, okay, cool, there we go. But we, sorry, we also have conceptual frameworks and one of the most famous currently is One Health, which has been much spoken of during this time of COVID. And nutrition is somewhere in there, but it's so, that, so small you will hardly find it. And there's a little bit of foodborne disease around veterinary public health and in medicine and human health. But again, uh, these, these, uh, these conceptual frameworks, when they're all encompassing, can be too, too encompassing to act as a guide. In terms of food safety, we have specific frameworks for risk analysis. This is just three different versions of it. And it's actually a pragmatic, actionable way of improving food safety, looking at the assessing the risk, managing the risk, but most importantly, bi-directional communication. But frameworks will get us to research and research will get us to papers and papers will get us nowhere unless we can get them to people who want to change. So quite a lot of my work has been based on uh, developing uh, evidence-based and research-based um, papers, documents, briefs for uh, policy makers and decision makers in order to bring their attention to the role of food safety. And, oops, and quite a lot of that has been looking at interdisciplinary areas such as the this report we did with Chatham on uh, the influence of livestock food and nutrition. So this is the intersection of nutrition, food safety, livestock food. But that by itself is not uh, always enough to get change. And we've also been working quite closely with economists because we find that um, when, when the Ministry of Health asks for something, um, people, the government is interested, but when the Ministry of Finance ask for something, they tend to guess it. And uh, this was the first assessment of the total cost of uh, foodborne disease in low and middle income countries. I did it alongside, along with the World Bank. And I think the takeaway home message here is the huge cost of foodborne disease, 95 million, 95 billion uh, dollars. And nearly all of that is from f unsafe f f food sold in informal markets. It's not from trade, it's not from illness, it's not from the formal sector. 
Another thing which has come out from our research is how little people understand food safety. And like Joyce is saying, once you start working in an interdisciplinary mode, you realize that you talk a different language and the things you think are so are often not so. I won't go into detail in this study, but it's just how even dealing with a range of experts, basically their conception, their preconception of risk was completely wrong. Um, so what can we do? Fortunately, there are a lot of moving from, from frameworks to, to uh, getting the evidence to the people who, who can act on it, to persuading people to invest in it, then to developing the, the technologies and training and incentives. More than anything else, we find incentives and behavior change. Uh, and there has been limited example. Uh, a couple of studies we've done, we found that we've improved very much the safety of milk, uh, got a lot of vendors on board, uh, and then got consumers at scale, 6 million consumers in Kenya drinking safer milk. But 6 million consumers out of 6 billion consumers is still a very far way to go. So um, how do we reach more people? Part of it is by increasingly You're working fine. with the formal fine. sector. Um, this, you may not believe it, is the formal sector in I Uganda. Uh, again, awareness, teaching, training, but awareness and training without incentives will not get us anywhere. So foodborne disease is important. Yes, a huge focus. People are very bad at judging risks. It's probably increasing. Uh, we have some promising approaches, but a big job ahead of us. Thank you all for listening to me. Thanks, Delia. That was great. Some really great insights there. Um, I realize we're really, we're really pushed for time here. Um, we've had some really, really interesting questions in the chat, um, which I'd like us to address just briefly before before we go for a short break. Um, could I just also ask if you're if you're not talking, could you just check that you have your microphone on mute? Because I think we were getting some interference there somewhere along the line. Um, so, in the interest of time, um, let's take some of the questions uh, from the chat. So, I'll try it and see if we can just pick some uh, from each uh, presentation. Um, so um, we have a question from uh, Valerie Nelson from NRI uh, for um, uh, Shilpa and, and part of me, I guess, too, in terms of um, how do uh, these kind of frameworks address issues of power? Um, Shilpa, do you want to address that? Um, I can start and um, I don't, my video doesn't seem to be working, but I can start. And then if you have something to add, please go ahead. Um, sure. One of the things that, you know, we talked about was the need to include um, gender dynamics and the way that that manifested in these in the information we had from the investigators were issues of, you know, women's um, women's decision making within households in terms of purchasing, in terms of what to feed. Um, also, you know, who had um, who had the shopping the shopping power and things like that. And what we talked about was whether this should be presented as possibly. Um, gender dynamics or whether it should be presented as equity um, and whether that should be something that should be considered in future iterations. Um, Chris, what do, you, what do you have to add to that? Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and, and one of the things too, in terms of the way, for example, the, the, the work that Shilpa presented with the food environment's conceptual framework, we were sort of, we were sort of looking to depict the food environment as that, as that interface, as I said. And then um, in my mind, when we were designing, I mean, clearly it was, a, it was a, a group process and an iterative process. But I was thinking that people could bring their, you know, in their specific disciplinary lens to that. So you could apply a gender lens to the analysis of that framework, or you could, um, you could sort of um, uh, use a political economy uh, analysis of power and look at the, the different dimensions and see for who, in what context, are specific dimensions important and why. Uh, and, and so that's kind of how I was thinking. But clearly, you know, as, a, as you've seen from the work today that Shilpa has presented, these concepts are evolving all the time. And we're, we're looking to, as we implement them, we're learning more about the gaps that are there. And this is something that we clearly need to look at going forward is how do we find ways to incorporate these different analytical approaches and these different research uh, disciplines and themes into these frameworks. Um, related to that, and let's move on to just the next question, which is, as I said, it's somewhat related. Um, we had a comment from Linda um, about food safety. And I think maybe Delia could maybe add uh, a comment on that too. And she said that food safety cannot be compromised. There are clearly strong links between food safety, nutrition, and public health and quality assurance used to consistently provide 
uh, suppliers to ensure safe and wholesome food supplies uh, for national populations. But these links are often overlooked um, as illustrated by these frameworks today. And I completely agree with that. And I think um, uh, food safety is in, in, in the food uh, environment framework. And it, I think it's implicit in the food systems frameworks that we've looked at today. But it, I th my personal opinion is that it, it probably needs to be lifted to the fore because it, it comes up time and time again. Uh, clearly, it's not my area of expertise. So Delia, I don't know if you have a comment to, to add to that. Yes, yeah, so I think food safety has always been a bit the Cinderella of the, the food security and, and, and food nutrition. Um, it, it's very important to people and, and it's very important to health. But it, and, and I hope I'm not step, s being inappropriate here, but it's really hard in low and middle income countries to live without trade-offs. So in an ideal world, all food would be perfectly safe and all, food, all kids would be perfectly fed but in the real world, like in Kenya, unpasteurized milk, raw milk is about half the price of pasteurized milk. Um, so a mother has to have a, face a trade-off there. Does, does she buy, and, and the choice they make, 80% of poor mothers buy the less safe milk uh, so they can give more of it to their kids. And I think that's one of the things we need to do with these, these conceptual frameworks. It's the bi-directionality, that when you're pushing on one thing to make it better, you can make something else worse. Uh, and that's a, a big challenge. Chris, can I also add something? Um, yeah, this is Shilta again. Related to what uh, Delia said in her presentation and in answer to this question, um, what we found also is that these perceptions of food safety, which is not just what is objectively unsafe, but what people felt was unsafe, was just as important as actually food prices and affordability for food. So you're absolutely right in that comment. It's it's critical and it can't be ignored. And these all these different frameworks um, and work going forward really needs to account for that wider conceptualization of food safety. Yeah, I completely agree. I have uh, just really quick, because I realize, we're, as I said, we're pushed for time. Um, we had a question here from Andy uh, from NRI, Andy Frost, uh, I presume, uh, asking, uh, what do the panel members consider to be the real priorities for food systems research in the future? Um, where do you suggest potential funders invest? And I think this ties in nicely too to uh, a comment um, by Fiorella for the panel, or a question more rather about what the thoughts uh, of the panel about integrating the role of food industries, uh, and, and I get, I'll add to that policies too, uh, across different levels in, in, in current, current frameworks and thinking about funding opportunities. Um, so yeah, uh, what do we think the, uh, the, the key priorities are? And, and just to comment on, on food industry, if anyone could talk to that, that'd be brilliant. Now, I, I think uh, that question is very valid. And one of the problems that we're seeing is Yes, we have a research multidisciplinary, but the, the concept of multidisciplinary itself has to be researched on so that we understand exactly how people can work together from different disciplines. So that would be one area that uh, research can be conducted to really see how multidisciplinary can work in a food system or any other uh, area. Uh, but another area that I would imagine uh, would need research, you know, with these frameworks, there are a lot of uh, arrows pointing all directions. Uh, and obviously there are assumptions that people draw from establishing these linkages. But sometimes these assumptions are never like tested to, to find out exactly what are the mechanisms of linkage that we see uh, in these conceptual frameworks. So uh, sometimes these conceptual frameworks do not present the assumptions explicitly so that people can actually see what the designer or someone who developed the conceptual framework was thinking about when drawing these boxes and lines. So these assumptions are never put across. And these are the, what, the areas where we really need to do research on to find out if I had one idea. Yeah, I would have managed to uh, idea to put forward probably. 
I'll be able to do that some other time. Thanks. That's great. I mean, uh, uh, just a, a comment on that too, from, from my perspective, I think um, in terms of priorities uh, for investment from funders, I think it's really important that clearly we've identified these different sections of the food system. Um, and I think it's really important that we seek to uh, invest across the food system in, in projects that investigate these different areas and seek to, as, as Joyce mentioned, untangle these relationships between them. Um, and also in terms of Clearly, as, as Dom spoke to today, you know, the, the importance of developing uh, metrics that are available to, um, to sort of integrate data and, and toolkits which are able to collect data from across the food system in a, in a sort of meaningful um, and coherent way. Because there's, there's a lot of research out there, but, uh, and, and clearly the conceptual understanding is building. Um, but it's quite difficult, I think, at the moment when, when data is so disparate. And that's one of the reasons why I showed the dashboard, even though that's quite a, a high level. Um, I think I think if we could if we could get a bit further down and dig deeper into some projects which do look across the food system in the different ways, and I know uh, you know speaking to Fiorella's comment about the food industry too, maybe that's one way to start would be to pick you know specific areas of interest within the wider food system, for example the food industry in a given setting, and then look to address these different components across and try and trace as a case study, for example, because I think I think that's really a challenge at the moment. We we just don't have. Uh, the sort of integrated tools and metrics to be able to do that. Um, although, you know, clearly it's, it's, it's on the agenda at the moment. So I realise we're, we're pretty much out of time now uh, and we're supposed to be going for a break sort of 10 minutes ago. Um, so if we, uh, shall we still stick with 10 minutes, Julia? Are you okay with that? Yeah, I think that sounds fine. Um, maybe uh, we can be back just a bit before quarter past and we'll go into our second panel then. That would be brilliant. Thank you to all the panellists and thank you for everyone to listen in and your comments and engagement. Sorry we couldn't get through all of them, uh, but we've collated them here and perhaps we'll find a way to, to disseminate some of them afterwards. Uh, thanks a lot. Hoping that people are coming back from that short break now. Um, we might sort of push ahead. We've got a pretty tight schedule, but um, looking forward to moving on to the second uh, panel uh, session. So I think uh, Laura, if you're able to um, share your screen. We'll uh, move forward with our second panel today. Okay, so hello everybody. I'm Laura Forsyth, Associate Professor in Gender and Inequalities and the lead of the Gender and Social Difference Program at NRI. So I'm very excited about this panel. We have a number of speakers that I'm sure you'll be very interested in hearing from. So firstly, I want to thank Julia and Professor Adrienne Martin for helping create the space for gender equity and diversity in this conference, which we hope will expand as the FANCY program progresses. I also want to thank Kate, June, Fiorella, Valerie for valuable conversations that have fed into this presentation, amongst other things. Um, so now I'll just give you a very quick presentation uh, to put the panel into a little bit of context. Uh, so I thought it would be helpful to begin the panel with Lord Botang's question yesterday and his opening remarks to the conference, why are you here, which is used as a greeting in Ghana and serves to remind us of our purpose. So hopefully I'm not being too presumptuous, but for many of us here, um, it is to understand the dynamics around gender equity and diversity in the context of food systems for nutrition. So I may be stating the obvious, but your starting point or your answer to why you are here is very important, particularly in interdisciplinary work in which space, both conceptually and practically, is often very limited. Using gender equity and diversity as a starting point means that the end goal is not necessarily to improve nutritional outcomes, Instead, it's about change, empowerment, and transportation, uh, transformation as an end in itself. And this was reflected, well, it is reflected in SDG 5, but it's also a strong message coming from Dr. Juki's presentation uh, that we heard yesterday. So um, when wading through the complexity of food systems, it's important to keep the starting point in mind. And as you are aware, there is considerable momentum and activity around food systems and food systems for nutrition, in which gender equity and diversity is a feature. And I'm thinking here about the 2020 high-level high panel for, of experts and their revision to the 2017 framework, which places greater emphasis on agency, in which feminist thinking has been absolutely crucial. 
Several reviews of literature have also pointed out important gaps in knowledge, specifically around gender and power relations in spaces where food is exchanged and how different actors interact. Also intersectional aspects of equity and different measurement approaches. Jody Harris will also present some important gaps identified from her review that she undertook on equity in agriculture, nutrition and health research. Importantly, this is also a very contested space where gender equity and diversity are presented in very different ways. From instrumental approaches where, for example, women are primarily seen as a vehicle to improve nutritional outcomes, and apologies for this crude analogy, um, to more transformative and feminist approaches. So there's a lot of work to be done. And this provides us with an opportunity to learn from a rich history of feminist and international thinking and social action, such as in gender and agriculture, food sovereignty, et cetera, that can help make our work more impactful. So reiterating comments from Dr. Nanjuki and also from Chikonde in yesterday's chat, um, linking with people who specialize in these areas and also increasing capacity of researchers in transformative approaches is absolutely crucial. Some of the conversations we're having within the Gender and Social Difference Program at NRI and with our partners are about how we can use our experience and current opportunities to promote more meaningful social change. How can our research itself be part of this change? And how can our tools align with the vision? There is also a significant amount of exciting and contemporary work in feminist and equity-based research, including further debate on the conceptualization and measurement of women's empowerment, uh, an agency, also around indigenous rights, social reproduction, and epigenetics. These new avenues provide us with new opportunities for their application in food systems and nutrition. So our panelists are presenting on some of these very exciting new areas of work, and they all use gender equity and or diversity as their starting point for understanding food systems for nutrition. And each presenter highlights different aspects. So Jody Harris offers a conceptual framework for examining equity in food systems for nutrition. Alessandra and Gwen enrich our understanding of the contested area of women's empowerment, both conceptually and methodologically. Sarah shares her wonderful experience in Uganda that highlights disconnects in food systems for nutrition and practice when a gender perspective is taken. And Tanya concludes our panel panel providing an alternative to dominant conceptual frameworks through an indigenous framing of food systems for nutrition. So I'll stop here uh, and thank all the presenters in advance uh, for coming and spending their time, especially balancing, um, yeah, home, home issues and work issues. So thank you. Um, and we'll hear from Jody first. So I think Julia, if you could share your screen for uh, Jody to present. Thank you. Thanks, Laura, and thanks, Julia, for, for sharing that. Uh, so today I'm going to tell you about some work I've done with colleagues thinking about how we research equity and equality. So this is with some colleagues at the Institute of Development Studies. Uh, next slide. So first, um, Laura just said this, but I want to point out that like most philosophical ideas, equity and equality are definitely contested concepts. So I couldn't give you one single definition that everybody would agree with, but I can give you a sense of um, what I think equity and equality are based on and how we use them in our research that hopefully will help our discussion later. So equity and equality are underpinned by this idea of moral equality, the idea that all people count, and should be treated in some way as equals. So they are normative concepts. We're saying people should be treated equally. Um, so talking about things like equity and equality is value laden. It's based on how we think the world should be, um, but no more so than aiming for something like economic growth or human rights, which are also choices based on value systems. But what that does mean is that different people will prioritize different aspects of equity or equality or, or not prioritize them at all. Um, but this picture, um, famous picture version of, shows the essential difference, I think, between equity and equality, at least in the way that I've used it in my research. So equality focuses on outcome or the sameness of uh, that final distribution of, of boxes, whereas equity focuses on process and the fairness of a, a just distribution according to need. 
So equity and equality aren't the same, but they're not mutually exclusive. So one chooses to focus on outcome and the other on process very broadly. And one of the key concepts that underpins inequity and inequality is marginalization. So the treatment of a person or a group or a concept as insignificant or peripheral. And we know that a lot of uh, nutrition research concerns itself with aspects of marginalization. So people look at the disempowerment of women or disparities in income. But what we thought we were seeing in the literature uh, was that uh, food and nutrition research so far only has a partial treatment of of equity and equality issues. Uh, So next slide, please. So in a separate piece of work done by my colleague Nick Nisbet and myself, we've been thinking about what these issues of equity and equality mean for nutrition. And this is uh, a new framework of nutrition equity that we've been working on for some time. It's based on a well-established framework which describes the social determinants of health. um, And it draws on theory from social sciences, from development studies, areas that are, are a bit further ahead in thinking about these issues than nutrition has been. So some of this thinking was captured in our chapter for the Global Nutrition Report on Equity last year, and this paper will come out uh, later this year. So just to talk you through it very quickly, on the far left of the framework, the most fundamental drivers of who is marginalized and therefore who most often ends up malnourished is a combination of the norms and values in a certain society, which shape who is placed higher or lower on the, the social hierarchy, and then how these crystallize into governance of those societies through the political and institutional structures that that emerge. And then in the middle of the framework is people's social position in terms of things we've been talking about like gender or caste or religion or other factors that condition marginalization or inclusion and they all interact. And then the personal or group resources that people have to draw on in any different context, um, which often accrue over multiple lifetimes, people's human capital and potential accrues intergenerationally. And then to simplify all the different interactions that occur between social position and human capital and the social and political environment in terms of what's producing inequity, we use the ideas of injustice, unfairness and exclusion, which describe how these cycles of marginalization and discrimination occur. So there's much more detail in in the paper, but broadly, that's the combination of factors that determine at an individual or family or group level, um, people's material circumstances and their experience of the immediate food, health and care environments, which you might recognize from the uh, uh, UNICEF framework of malnutrition. So then on the far right, the ultimate outcome is who is malnourished, and that can be any form of malnutrition from under to over. And that's always unequal. Um, And it's not random, but it's based on these series of underlying factors for a particular context. So there was a a question earlier in the chat about how food systems frameworks address issues of power. Uh, And for me, the answer is that broadly they don't. So this framework is trying to bring in some of those issues of, of social and political power that often are or have been missing, certainly in nutrition work. Um, next slide, please. Uh, could you tap once more, actually, so it gets the other? Excellent. So you can read more about those equity ideas when the paper comes out. But last year, we wanted to apply those ideas to see how agriculture, nutrition, health research, ANH research addressed those issues. So we undertook a review and the broad question was, how does ANH research address equity issues in low and middle income countries? Um, And the review had to cover agriculture plus either nutritional health, plus equity, plus be in a low and middle income uh, country context. So that just the middle dark section in that Venn diagram. Um, so all those ideas on equity and, and equality informed our conceptual framework for the study. And in the end, we found uh, 243 papers that we mapped to look at how these papers address equity or inequality. Uh, next slide. So this figure brings that review together. It shows the density of research covering the different equity topics uh, on the left there uh, within each of the ANH topics, which are along the top. So there's a lot of nuance within different agriculture or nutrition or health topics. 
But broadly, there were most papers looking at unequal outcomes. So inequality of outcome based on social position, things like through gender, do women or men do better, that kind of thing. Then the most next looked at was, was material circumstances, things like the resources and assets or physical and human capital available to people. And then the fewest papers looked at the structural determinants of inequity, the things like the norms and values and broader uh, political or social exclusion. So we summarized that most papers in ANH research, if they look at equity, looked at what the uh, inequality problem is, fewer looked at how that inequity was shaped, and then fewer still looked at why the inequity exists in the first place. So there's a lot more detail available in the paper that should be out literally any day. Um, but related uh, to equity, the key point is that people researching ANH, those of us researching ANH, very often focus towards the upper end, the right hand side of that nutrition equity, equity framework, rather than on the sort of deeper drivers of inequity. So I hope we can discuss uh, later whether we think that's the right approach and what the, the implications are. Uh, next slide. So I just put this in because it was Martin Luther King Day in the USA the other day. And uh, this quote struck me as really relevant to what we're talking about today. So um, you should go and click this link when you get the slides and, and have a look. But Martin Luther King said, I believe that we ought to do all we can to seek to lift ourselves by our own bootstraps. But it's a cruel joke to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And to me, that kind of captures these structural determinants of inequity. They're rooted in history and culture. They're passed down intergenerationally. And they're what limit people from achieving their potential nutritionally or otherwise. Um, next slide. So lastly, then, uh, what can we do to, to redress this, to address it? So the work on equity and the structural determinants of malnutrition maps well to some other work that we've done uh, on the basic determinants of malnutrition. So we see inequity and marginalization as some of those fundamental drivers of uh, malnutrition at the basic level. But we're very clear that this isn't just a kind of black box of context, which is how it's very often talked about in nutrition research, but it's an intelligible issue that we can understand and that we can do something about. So this paper, which is out, um, looks at the evidence around what can be done to address these social and political determinants of nutrition. So for food, health and care in the short, medium and long term, we can do things like uh, from actively working to improve political and social participation to explicitly considering some of those structural drivers in policy making and in programming to targeting things like safety net programs to groups who have suffered this structural marginalization. So it's we can understand it because we have better and better thinking about it, but we can also do practical things to address it, even if they're not specifically in nutrition work. Um, so just last slide, um, you might need to go to some of those papers later for some detail because I'm very much out of time, but I do look forward to our discussion today and thank you all for, for having me here. Thanks so much, Jody. That was a brilliant presentation. So thanks for starting off our panel. So I can ask now um, Alessandra, if you're ready. And I think you're going to, yes, perfect. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I hope you can hear me. I had okay. initially my headphone. Ah, great. Okay, great. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Alessandra Gallier, and I work as a team lead at Gender in the International Livestock Research Institute. Uh, today's presentation is about the gender lens in livestock development for women's empowerment and uh, nutrition security. So first of all, uh, the first question is why women's empowerment in livestock development for food and nutrition security? Um, so we know that women are the majority of poor livestock keepers. We also know that um, animal source foods are essential for the food and nutrition security of the women themselves and of their households in low and middle income countries. Uh, we know that livestock and livestock products are um, important sources of income, especially for women who have a few alternatives to, uh, to get an income. And very often women use this income to purchase uh, other food. 
Uh, we also know that livestock um, are more easily controlled by women than other assets such as machinery or buildings and so on. So this is to say that livestock is essential for food and nutrition security and also for women's empowerment. At the same time, we also know that women have limited control over livestock and farm resources. We know based on the work that we do at Ilbury that when livestock is intensified and it focuses on commercialization, then women generally tend to lose control over livestock products and the income that they derive from it. So it's very important that we engage with gender responsive livestock development to enhance women's empowerment and also food and nutrition security. So how can we actually learn about the ways in which livestock can enhance uh, women's empowerment. So we've developed a tool that is called the Women's Empowerment in Livestock Index, um, which builds uh, on the WEA, on the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index, I'm sure you heard already about. Uh, the Women's Empowerment in Livestock Index, the WELI, is a standardized measure to assess the empowerment of women in the livestock sector. It provides data on the level of empowerment of a given woman in a livestock community and men in the same household, uh, women in a community when we aggregate the data, and also what livestock activities affect empowerment over time. Now, this is great. It's great to have a tool that helps us measure quantitatively mostly and also qualitatively, whether we are progressing on supporting women's empowerment and which livestock activities are most effective to do so. But then as we work on this and we utilize these tools, um, we also start looking, of course, at the nuances uh, that, and some of the shortcomings of the tools. So some food for thought about these tools, so we can also put the results of the tools into perspective. So first of all, one definition of empowerment that we often use is that of empowerment as an individual path to self-determination. So how does that fit that definition with a standard measure of empowerment such as the WELI? Uh, also, we know that empowerment is a very complex process of change. So how does that, how is it represented with, you know, with a one index number? Also, again, if uh, um, empowerment is about an individual path to self-determination, does it make sense to look at comparison of women's empowerment across communities, or should we rather look for, uh, look at how, you know, a person's experience changes over time. And finally, how do we interpret, how do we make sense of comparing women's empowerment vis-a-vis -vis men's empowerment? So we worked on a publication and on a concept, the concept of power through, which was published last year, which is somehow looks at some of these nuances of empowerment that again help us put into perspective a tool uh, such as the WELI. So, um, the, the power through um, adds one concept of concept of power to the usual four concepts of power that you find in the literature. And the literature you usually look at, you know, you, you find very often power within, power to, power with, and power over. Um, power through adds another dimension, a fifth dimension, with, which speaks about an involuntary relational form of power that is a precondition for other empowerment of disempowerment. So power through speaks about the fact that empowerment is mediated also by the empowerment status of associated others. And this is expressed by Maha. Maha says, when my sister became a teacher, the whole village looked at me with admiration. So she says that she speaks about the fact that when her sister got empowered by her new job, she herself got indirectly empowered because of her sister's empowerment. So the two empowerments worked together. Um, power through also speaks about empowerment mediated by personal characteristics vis-a-vis -vis gender norms. And this is represented by this talk we had with these women in, uh, in Ghana, where they talked about the fact that uh, a woman to be empowered needs to be self-confident. They added, however, that if that self-confidence made the woman a disrespectful wife, then this woman could not be empowered. So it really means that, you know, the individual characteristics of being self-confident needs also to work with the local uh, norms about what it means to be a good wife for empowerment to actually take place. And then the third concept, uh, empowerment mediated by normative judgment by the community. And this is expressed by Fatma. She said, well, when I started selling the chicken, I started making money and felt empowered. But the village was not happy. They did not want her to. They didn't think she was, you know, as a woman able or she should sell the chicken and control the money. So her husband 
ended up leaving them because he felt so uncomfortable. And she said that they were struggling with making ends meet and you know, securing the food because she was left as the sole um, income um, breadwinner. So concluding remarks, um, the presentation was about the fact that livestock is essential for food and nutrition security and for women's empowerment in low and middle income countries, about the fact that women's empowerment needs to be understood, situated within gender dynamics. You can't look at women's empowerment in a vacuum. You need to understand the gender dynamics that surround it. Also that empowerment is not a zero sum game. It's not that we are supporting a woman's empowerment by you know, decreasing the power of her husband or her sons or her daughters. There is a lot to, say, to be said about the fact that one's empowerment needs the empowerment of others to increase for her own to increase also. And this is related also to point number four, which is individual empowerment is mediated by household empowerment vis-a-vis -vis the community. Meaning if you have an, an individual who is empowered in a household, but because of the way this empowerment took place, the village thinks that the whole household actually is disempowered or looks down on the household, then these individuals will not experience empowerment in their daily life. And similarly, point five says, you know, one thing is to get the number in an index like the Welly, and the other thing is to understand how it is, the, how, what is the experienced uh, life of these people on the ground. Like you may, may have an increase in the number of the index, but when you talk to the, you know, the tool respondents, they may actually talk about the fact that yes, there was a number, the, the decision making increased. However, you know, they are really feeling whatever, uh, marginalized by the community and altogether they feel disempowered. And the last point is just to reiterate that, you know, um, empowering women purposefully remains critical. We are not arguing that empowering men as a means to empower women simply will not work. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Alessandra. That was that was brilliant. Um, I really like the concept of power through and it really resonates with some of the, uh, my own research findings. So I, I thought that was really helpful. So now if we could go to Gwen Varley and Julia. Oh, there you are, Alessandra. Nice to see your face. <laughs> um, so Sorry, if, I put the video off for the, for the connection. <laughs> no, it was good. Um, yes. So Gwen, are you there? Are you ready? No. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Laura. Great. Great. Um, yeah, so today I would like to speak about the relationships between outcomes in women's empowerment and outcomes in children's nutrition uh, and the most predominant pathways that theoretically connect these two objectives, which currently usually fall under three categories. One, women's role as primary caregiver for children. Two, women's physiological contributions to pregnancy and breastfeeding and three, women's choices to allocate more income and time toward the food that they give their children. Now, each of these conceptual pathways may seem intuitive enough, uh, but I'd like us to take a closer look at exactly how women's empowerment can be achieved as an outcome of equal importance to children's nutrition, as Laura mentioned earlier. And throughout this discussion, it's important to remember that women's empowerment can only be achieved if women's ability to make strategic life choices have been expanded. So to illustrate my points, I'll be referring briefly to the results from 30 in-depth interviews that were collected uh, from women living in the eastern region of Uganda, who all had children under the age of three. Uh, and this was part of the Drivers of Food Choice program that Shilpa described earlier. So let's start with the first pathway, targeting women's role as primary caregiver for children. The mothers that we interviewed in Uganda were almost always the primary caregiver for young children, and they also articulated extremely clear visions of how they wanted to parent. They wanted to give their children a wider variety of foods. They wanted to be able to afford more expensive foods like fish and rice. And they wanted to be able to afford to send their children to school consistently, to afford healthcare when they needed it, and to have enough money left over to buy something nice for themselves now and then. And women often faced excruciating trade-offs between each of these things, as Delia pointed out earlier. And aside from the financial poverty, they also spoke of time poverty and how they struggled to balance laborious agricultural work with care work. So, 
when we talk about empowering women as caregivers, it's important to remember that encouraging women to parent in a particular way, such as buying or cooking a particular food, that's not the same as empowering a woman to achieve whatever type of parenting approach she aspires to, whether or not that's the most direct or the most cost efficient path to improving children's nutrition. And this also includes supporting women's ability to choose not to be the, pri the child's primary caregiver at all and to make it more socially acceptable for men to take on caregiving roles if that's what suits the household better. And moving swiftly on to the second pathway, uh, when we talk about women's ability to influence children's nutrition during pregnancy and breastfeeding, it's important that we're not focused on too narrow of a window, meaning it's impossible to assess women's empowerment just within the first 1,000 days. It's important to support women's empowerment throughout the entire process of becoming and being a parent. And that includes decisions about when and how to have children in the first place. So to return to our results from Uganda, women consistently brought up two barriers to giving their children the foods that they wanted to. First, women complained about a lack of access to birth control options. And second, women unanimously had negative views of polygyny and frequently pointed out that every time their husband married another wife or had more children, resources for feeding her own children got scarcer and scarcer and her need for independent income became more urgent. And for many women, this was something that had happened already. For others, it was something they were worried would happen in the future. So again, we return to this theme of the importance of empowering women to be the kind of parent that they want to be. Uh, and when we focus on that ability to make choices in all aspects of a woman's life, not just those areas that are very obviously immediately connected to children's nutrition, it actually becomes easier to identify some of these more systemic barriers, which in this particular example are rooted in patriarchal gender norms uh, and do in fact appear to ultimately have an impact on children's nutrition. Uh, and because time is short, I won't say very much about the third pathway except that from an empowerment perspective, it's really just a subsidiary of the first pathway because allocation of household resources is basically a subtype of caregiving decisions. And I'll stress again that in order for empowerment to be taking place, women need to be able to spend those resources according to her own parenting priorities, which may or may not align exactly uh, with all the priorities of a particular development intervention. So in closing, it's important when assessing empowerment to understand women's own aspirations and focus on supporting women in achieving the milestones that they have defined for themselves. These aspirations certainly won't be universal across cultures or even within a single community. So the more that agriculture and nutrition programs are focused on improving food systems holistically, as many people have mentioned, uh, so that those systems offer more choices to individuals, such as a wider variety of foods, a range of livelihood options, agency in their marriage, easily accessible education and healthcare, the likelier those programs are to actually achieve women's empowerment because women will then be able to decide when to have children, how they want to parent, how they want to earn income and how they want to spend their income. In other words, make strategic life choices on their own terms. So uh, that was a really whirlwind tour of this topic. Uh, but I'm looking forward to discussing it in more detail in the rest of the session. Thanks, Gwen. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. And Gwen is finishing her PhD with NRI. So for her to take the time to do this is, um, yeah, it, it, it's very difficult. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, but everyone will benefit from, from your presentation. So now we'll go on to Sarah Mayanja and uh, she works at the International Potato Center, and she's going to share some of uh, the results from her work in Uganda. Sarah? Yes, yeah. great. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, thank you Laura. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening to everyone, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'd like to share um, some of experiences and 
working with gender and food, uh, the orange sweet potato, and how will this weaves into nutrition? Next slide, please. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, thank you. Uh, so the orange flesh sweet potato is a miracula, miraculous fruit. Uh, just 40%, uh, it's been found that over 40% of children under five suffer from vitamin A deficiency. But uh, a small root that weighs just about 100 grams is enough to provide the vitamin A needs for children. So in Uganda and Sub-Saharan Africa, as a result, there's been a drive to, per, to use the OFSP as a food-based approach for providing vitamin A. So there's been uh, many efforts and uh, as a result, uh, up to 2016 or thereabouts, close to 3 million people had been reached with this technology and 42 varieties had been released and distributed in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. However, adoption of this uh, OFSP still remains very low. And we think it's likely due to gender biases which contribute to them. And uh, I'd like to share some of these gender biases in some of the studies I've seen. For example, in breeding, in a study that we did, we uh, sought to understand the characteristics that men and women prefer for orange flesh sweet potato. Our study found that uh, men prefer the market-related market characteristics, while women prefer culinary-related traits such as uh, easy to peel, uh, tasty, sweet, um, to them, those were the most important characteristics that they dwelt on. But when you look at the breeding profile, product profiles, it's very hard to find a characteristic, say, like easy to peel in a sweet potato product profile. So it's more likely that the traits that men prefer will be the ones that breeders will focus on. And then when it got to varieties, asking this same uh, study group what varieties they preferred, we found that men really liked the OFSP varieties. They, they prioritized uh, one OFSP variety as their number one. Whereas for women, it was local varieties. And what's surprising about this is that most of the OFSP promotion focuses mainly on women, especially women with uh, children, women of childbearing age. So there seems then there to be a disconnect between what we are trying to do to promote OFSP and what is really actually actually up happening at the at the ground. And then uh, with relation to where they got this planting material from. The men were able to prioritize NGOs and map pliers, whereas for women, it was from neighbors. Now, OFSP is an improved variety, so it will come to the community through NGOs, through map pliers. So it means still the women will not have as good access to it as men will. Next slide, please. And the other angle I'd like to share is about the scaling and diffusion strategies that we've used over time. When you look at training, uh, we have training at, uh, in various disciplines and at various levels. So the training in agronomy, which is usually the very starter training, focuses on men. It's done outside the community. It's done by scientists. And so uh, men are really looked at as fountains of knowledge. They know every, they should know everything. And so uh, they have this knowledge, uh, they're given this knowledge. Then when you look at on the other hand, the new trainings on nutrition are usually combined with trainings on cooking and they're delivered at community level 
which is good, but then it really focuses mostly on women. But guess what happens? So because of the household and societal dynamics, um, what at the end of the day, you will find that a man has this knowledge on agronomy, but he is not the one who's going to plant. He's not the one who's going to weed. He will not be doing all these other roles and roles related to sweet potato production. And the woman who does not have this knowledge is the one who's supposed to do that. And sometimes transfer of knowledge is not as smooth as we suppose it will be that when my husband goes for the training, he will come home and start telling me about pests and disease control. Then when you look at the nutrition training, I will be invited to this training as a woman. I will learn how to prepare these nice dishes which in incorporate uh, orange flesh, sweet potato, but I will not have a, a, a say on the resources. Say, supposing I need to incorporate a little wheat into my uh, recipe, I will not be able to do that. Supposing I need to grow a little bit, um, a bigger garden of orange flesh sweet potato to be able to, to do all these other uh, recipes that I've, I've seen or even be able to sell like some women have been able to do. It's my husband probably who will decide where which crop will be planted, how much acreage will go there, and uh, how much resources, say like labor, if I need additional labor, how much of that can come to me? So because of this disconnect, you will find that you have these communities well-trained, but when you get down there to find, you ask the women, so are you now preparing these beautiful dishes that uh, in Ethiopia, there is an OFSB best injera? Oh, no, we are not. And then when you come to ask these questions, you realize that there was a mismatch between, uh, there was a missing link in connecting this agri agriculture, nutrition, and the gender dynamics that seem to be missed out. And then yesterday, Jemima talked about the importance of enterprises for women. So in OFSP, we have what we call the multipliers, or we call them decentralized multipliers, vine multipliers. And this is very good business. However, it requires a bit of resources. You must have access to a, a pump. You must have access to, you must be able to shelter your seed against pests and diseases. So it's quite resource intense and mostly men engage in this. So you will find that two things happen here. Uh, men and uh, women are not able to engage in this business. And because mostly women get seed from fellow women, they will not, they'll find it very hard to get this improved seed from uh, the deviants. And next slide, please. So my last um, slide focuses on uh, what uh, it, it kind of rhymes with what uh, Alexandra, Alexandra was telling us about. When we, we did a gender scoping study in Uganda and we asked the women what they do after they've sold their sweet, sweet potatoes. So they said, oh, we, sell, we save our money and we buy small animals like chicken. This is a very important way of saving our money because if you keep the money in in your cupboard then your husband probably will come and take it so however this was a very good initiative but when we delve more to find out about what was really happening about this uh livestock and sweet potato we found out that the, the, the wife needs permission from the spouse to rear the chicken so she can't just bring it bring this in she needs the permission to utilize the chicken products so like the eggs. She can't just eat them. And then where I come from, culture prohibits women and girls to eat chicken. So you will find that though uh, the chicken is a very important addition into the diet with the sweet potato plus the eggs, it might not benefit women and uh, the girls. So you see, there's still a disconnect between all of these very good uh, strategies that are being are taking place. And uh, I would like to end by calling for a more joined up thinking for approaches that integrate a gender perspective into nutrition and agriculture. 
and hopefully then we'll see better um, perspectives and lives for the people we work for. Thank you. Sarah, thanks so much. And Alessandra put a, a great comment that it's great to see the problem with chicken. <laughs> um, and it, it, thank you, Sarah. And also it, it links uh, quite nicely to what Shilpa was saying in the, the previous theme about uh, the need to look at women uh, women's role in household decision making. So we're, we're completely running over on time, I believe, but it's the first panel's fault, so it's not ours. So <laughs> I'm just kidding. But anyways, we have to, we have to be careful. <laughs> That's entirely <laughs> um, But Tanya, if, if I can ask you to present, and I think she'll be um, sharing her, her screen for us. Thanks, yes, Tanya. I'm here. So thank you very much. Let me just put this in a full mode first. Mm, give me a second and then. Now it's ready. Okay, let me know if my voice is cutting so I can turn off the camera. Um, so my presentation, it's entitled Food and Nutrition Sovereignty and linking to the first presentation um, from Harris. Well, it links basically from us or it's from a social justice perspective. That's why I, I decided to name it this way. So just to give you some big figures, in the world there are approximately 476 million of indigenous peoples, and they inhabit a less than a 25% of the world's territory, and yet they preserve the 80% of the world's biodiversity. Ironically, they also make up the 15% of the extreme poor in the world. So every six seconds, a forest the size of a soccer field gets lost, which then it's not only threatening the life of indigenous peoples, but also of the world. Just adding more figures in the world, there are approximately 400,000 plants and from there, 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 there are approximately 30,000 reported as edible. But in research and agriculture, we mainly focus on 120 crops and specifically on three major crops, which are wheat, rice, and maize, because they make up or contribute to the 50% of the caloric intake around the world. Thus, as we see, there's like a lot of potential on many crops that are underutilized, and many of those crops link to indigenous communities. With the COVID-19 and the climate crisis that we are facing, there's a call that we need to look at local and holistic solutions. So, that picture you are seeing now, it's a Achara, which is a forest garden in the Peruvian Amazon, where we are conducting a work, uh, research as NRI. And it seems like a simple system, but in reality, it's more complex than that. So, from the environmental perspective, you see pumpkin in that system that actually adds to the, to the diet of the families, but helps with erosion. We have beans that help in fixing nitrogen. We also have many plants that help a, with environmental issues, but at the same time that can contribute to the diets of peoples. One of the key questions, especially when we promote a, a nutrition or food security, is we tend to promote a lot a monocropping in one crop specifically or one approach. When actually there's a lot of knowledge that it's in these communities, within these communities, and that we could be used. For example, in the communities, native nations of Nushalk in Canada, one of the key questions many people had was, is it possible that these uh, indigenous peoples can make a living and have a nutritious diet only by relying on fish? The answer is yes. Because actually there's research that shows that people still living in the reservations are actually healthier than the people that has migrated to urban areas. And at the same time, younger generations are presenting more diseases than many of the older generations that still rely on these foods. So just to say who we are blaming for all these changes. Well, in many of these cases, it could be linked to colonization and how it was, there was a shift on diets, but also there are many trends with the programs and the planning that we do that is not necessarily a designed in a culturally sensitive way. And that's something we are trying to address at NRI. So, but let me tell you a bit more. When I say a 
from the social perspective, talking about food sovereignty and nutrition. Usually we look at the crops as something material, but all these material things have many intangible meanings. Some of these intangible meanings are linked to identity, cosmovision, territory. So in the first picture you are seeing on the right hand, there's something that it's called the reading of maize, which basically it's a way in which many of these communities, specifically in, in Mexico, are guiding their lives and connected to nature. So they keep the seeds not only for food purposes, but also because it's linked to identity. In the picture in the middle, then you see three families that help each other to crop the chakras or the milpa fields, the maize fields. And also working in a collective way, it's a way of a cultivating velocity, but also enacting some sort of resilience because the more you are in exchanging a labor or a, um, with your uh, neighbors, you are more capable of surviving. That's what they say. So what is the role of territory and why I was mentioning all these areas that are being lost? Well, I like talking about territory as this bubble or the home of many of these communities where they can enact their right to self-determination to sort of to play with their own rules and define who they want to be. So this is the reason why we see in the world that also many people it's defending those territories. It's the center where they have all this diversity, the culture, the identity, but also where they can cultivate a, this collective action and where other values that are not necessarily linked to money can be seen. So is it possible to merge traditional knowledge and modern knowledge? I think yes. Let me give you this example that I love, which actually represents um, a farming community back in Mexico, Zapotecan indigenous farmers, who spent six months as migrants in the US and spent six months back in their homes. They preserve their native seeds, they use uh, irrigation systems and other technologies because they realized after many other experiences that even when they have money, if they have no crops or food locally, it's really hard to survive if a hurricane comes, if there's a drought. With all this diversity, they feel they can also ensure they have uh, like a constant source of food to the year. Let me give you now another example. We are talking about women and how we can help them also. This is a Nutrifuerza with Mayan women in Guatemala. And they decided to create a micro business or social business, let's say. And they are also merging different technologies, the native knowledge or the indigenous knowledge with modern technologies to produce many of the crops. But now they are moving one step beyond. They are adding value and creating teas, energetic bars and selling them to the market because they also realize that if they needed or if they wanted to improve their living conditions, they needed to do something else. And that's leading their own destiny in a way. So finally, to conclude, well, we are sort of exploring the same things now in a project that we have a, in the Amazona, in, in the Peruvian Amazonas with Dr. Pamela Katik at NRI, and we hope to also to come up with a, a nutritious approach or methodology where we can look at food sovereignty or nutrition sovereignty, which actually means yes, producing or providing in a local way, but also escalating in a different level at policy level on how we could make more culturally sensitive approaches that considers all these different visions of people that are usually undermined. Okay. Sorry, that's it. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> I didn't say goodbye. <laughs> Tanya, that was, that was fantastic. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, and I love the photographs and I, I love that project. Um, it's a facet. So we're looking forward to seeing the results. So, so thank you. Um, okay, so we're going to go very, very quickly to um, questions. And, and I think I'm only allowed to do three. Uh, let's see how it goes. And we'll give Tanya a break, not put her on the spot uh, right away. So let's take Lydia's, um, uh, I think, I believe Lydia, sorry, um, I think she's a PhD student at NRI. Her question is for the whole panel. 
uh, building on the evidence that there can be a disconnect between nutrition initiatives and local cultural contexts. What implications might this have going forward about how we develop and fund projects? Is there a need to develop projects more collaboratively with communities before funding is sought, for example? Or does funding grants need to be more flexible to adjust to locally identified initiatives? I thought that was a great comment slash question. Uh, and does anyone from the panel want to tackle that? Come on. <laughs> why, why has everybody disappeared? Okay. <laughs> uh, Sandra, I, I don't know if Jody's still yeah. here. The time difference is quite quite difficult for poor Jody. Um, but Alessandra, did you hear that question? Do you want to take that on? Yes, yeah, sure. So um, we've actually had some experience now with some of the funders asking us to, so we did the first submission of the proposal, the very short submission, and then there was an in-between phase where we actually got some money for the uh, project that made it in the first selection phase to consult with the local, whatever it was, private sector research organizations, communities, to then develop the full proposal. And I thought that was actually excellent because it did give us a chance to uh, check that the co local communities you know, found benefits in what we were doing, that our research would be um, you know, more, more uh, targeted towards what they were doing. Uh, in terms of you know, the cultural context and so on, in terms of the, the tools that I mentioned before, like the welly, this is of course one of the big issues. We, like, a lot of the funders want to have one tool that, that is a standard. There is a value to having a standard tool, right? To measure women's empowerment, for example, because then you can do it across projects, across countries, and that, that helps you learn what works, what doesn't work. But of course, there are a lot of shortcomings, which is a little bit what I was trying to talk about before. So I think we can still work a lot on the methodologies um, to, you know, kind of capture more of those uh, <laughs> complexities um, and, and also, you know, the local definitions of empowerment and the way the women themselves see their own path to self-determination. So mm -hmm. there is an issue of methodology. There is still a value in this kind of um, tools that uh, provide a standard measure. So it's, it's a, a bit of everything, I'd say, if that yeah, helps. <laughs> very much. Tanya, sorry, did you have something to add to that? Mm. I saw that you came on quickly. Well, I think to me, I, I didn't mention this, but just like recently, there was a hub a, from the FAO launched on indigenous food systems. So I see that, for example, now there's more opening. I use food sovereignty on purpose. Mm. Because now it's also recognized that there's not only one sim simple approach that focuses on productivity, which is like quite often what we do, but also that there are many other local ways to conceive food sovereignty or, or food access and that need to be considered on board. And I think that links to what Lydia was saying. So, yeah, I, 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 I still believe like there's a long way to go but starting to value the local knowledge or the local initiatives, it's just a good starting point, I would say. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we're gonna ask Sarah a question. Um, I think it's from Rosemary. Where do you think our policy, what, where do you think are the policy levers that could transform some of these long-standing dynamics reinforced by cultural norms? Ah, that's a, a big one. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you talk about policy levers. Um, but I think uh, one of the ways that we, before we even get to policy, the policy levers, is looking at, um, uh, like there's a project we worked with, uh, with, I've been working on with Laura, where we've really looked at the concept of multidisciplinarity and having the different uh, other scientists coming to work, say like with a gender team, like you do the work together, you, you, and then slowly but slowly they start buying into these issues. They see all the disparities, the, the, the issues of inequality that exist as we go out together in doing this research. So it's got to start from there before we jump 
to the policymakers. It's got to start with our own part, uh, colleagues in our teams where we work to believe that actually there is a case for this and it needs attention. Then we can from there build into inclusive research. And then by the time we get to the policy makers, then we'll have the whole of our institution, the whole team speaking with this unified voice and then policy makers, I think we'll get to here. But my point is that even before we get to the point, the policy makers in so many of our institutions, we've got to start from the very people that we work with so that we can have a unified position in understanding that these issues actually need attention. Thank you, Sarah. And Julia, I'm not quite sure if we have time for more questions or do we? We've, we've, we've actually got quite a few for, for Jody and Gwen, but I can follow up with them can after. Can I say something or... quickly? Sure. sure, please. Okay. Yeah, so just sort of kicking off from that last question about policymakers, I think we always look at policymakers as the audience for our work, but they're, they're not the only audience for our work. And I think in something as social and dynamic as equity, it might be that activists are uh, an, an equally important audience for the kind of work that we do. Um, because the, the idea of all these changes can be thought through using all the ideas and frameworks and things that we've all just uh, presented. But change comes best from inside communities. If you look at, uh, you know, feminism in the 30s and 60s in, in the West and, and uh, change for civil rights in the USA, you know, these things didn't necessarily, the policy was pushed by the activists. Um, and I think it's more likely that um, we can introduce ideas and knowledge, um, but change can't really be imposed or at least not sustainably. And it's going to take time. Um, but we should also be aware that any intervention we make into equity is essentially social engineering. So we have to be pretty sure that we're right in pushing for a certain thing, if that's what we're going to do with some of our interventions. And we absolutely need to consider uh, the trade-offs and unintended consequences that um, Delia was talking about earlier because you know the history is replete with um, uh, unintended consequences of social engineering so in terms of what that means for for funding and stuff we need to be a bit better at trusting communities or countries or populations and being genuinely participatory um, and funding i don't know if it will but it really needs to change drastically to be longer term uh, because these things, you know, women's empowerment does not change overnight um, and comfortable working with some of those upstream things, even if it's not immediately clear how the nutrition impact occurs. So that, that's my two cents on, on all of that. <laughs> that's a brilliant two cents. <laughs> that was really, really helpful. Thank you, Jody. Uh, Julia, I'll turn it over to you. Sorry, Gwen, we've got lots of questions, which I'll email you about, which I'm sure you have time to answer. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Laura, and thanks, everyone. Um, I, yeah, very disappointed that we're running so over time because I could see all the interesting questions flowing through. Um, so we are short on time. We had planned about half an hour for discussion groups, um, and I'm aware some people might have to leave um, at the end of this session sharply. But I think we'll still go into our discussion groups, and we'll take just twenty minutes to have a um, a bit of reflection and discussion in small groups. Um, if you do have to leave, we of course understand, um, but then we'll come back for just a very quick wrap up um, as a group. We won't have any feeding back from groups, but we'll just have some closing remarks. Um, so within discussion groups, we've got um, two things we'd like you to, to do. Um, first, we've got two questions that um, we'd like you to choose between. Um, given time is short, you'll probably um, only have time for one of these. Um, and these are kind of reflective questions based on um, each of the panels, um, drawing on your own experience, um, ideas that you know might have come up through the chat that haven't been um, adequately explored and acknowledged um, in our Q&A sessions. Um, particularly if you're sort of looking across contexts, I think some, um, some interesting insights could come up there. And then the second part of our um, breakout groups, we'd like you to just come back um, to the kind of big issues that um, you see us needing to take forward um, some of the big takeaways that you've um, received or um, have come to you during this session 
uh, particularly um, sort of spanning research policy and practice. Um, so um, our first two questions, which you'll have within your groups, um, the first one, reflecting on your own experience of using food system frameworks or um, tools or methods, um, thinking about some of their um, utility limitations and opportunities for improvement. Um, second option for your group's discussion is uh, reflecting on issues of gender equity and diversity approaches and um, the barriers and enabling factors to um, adopting um, or embracing these approaches within research policy and practice. And then finally, coming back to that kind of big picture question about, you know, what are the big takeaway messages and what are our kind of next steps in this space? So um, I will um, just ask you to be patient for a moment and I'll um, break you into groups. We've got um, an NRI facilitator for each of the groups and we'll also have um, our panel members distributed across the groups. So um, look forward to um, hearing back on your reflections um, through these groups. Panel, um, which was also, you know, super exciting. And of course, the panel was looking at trying to understand how dynamics around gender equity and diversity um, interplay in the context of um, food systems for nutrition. Um, and I think this seems to be an unresearched area, um, as Jody's you know, found out, looks particularly on the transformational kind of structural drivers. Um, and certainly the panel, and again, the questions and the discussions opened up some really exciting issues and debates there. Um, and I think the way that Laura framed it was perfect. Um, you know, are we looking at you know, how do we reconcile? How do we bring together? Is it possible? In what ways using um, women's empowerment as a, um, you know, is that an outcome in end in itself? Or are we looking at just improving nutrition outcomes with the kind of instrumental approach versus more transformative feminist approaches? And I think really, really important and exciting that we've started to bring that in the discussions. Um, if we can look at, um, getting transformative, um, transformational food systems. Um, all sorts of other exciting things in there, food sovereignty, um, all sorts of things about, you know, are these things workable? Um, how can we make them more usable and so on? But I think, you know, back to um, our kind of original intention, I think, was to um, open a space for people to share their ongoing work, both amongst NRI staff, amongst the fancy partners who are working mostly in institutions in Africa and beyond that. Um, and I think that um, from what we've heard today, it's been a really exciting start of sharing. Um, obviously only hearing five minutes from each panelist was probably just whetting our appetites. And um, it seems as though there's so much more to hear from the panelists and looking at the discussion um, and the questions, so much more to hear from the um, the, the other stakeholders that we've brought together here. And of course, that's, you know, a, we're, a, we're a group of, of researchers and we each, each have many other partners um, in policy and practice as well. So um, in terms of what next, um, the FANCY is a, um, program is obviously a research program with um, a, a, a set of partners, but um, it's an outward looking program. Um, and I think that um, what we would like to do as a kind of organizing group is um, put our heads together, definitely look at all the comments, all the findings, all the rapporteurs and discussions, exciting kind of answers to your questions, um, to the, the questions that are raised in the groups, um, the gaps, especially the big picture stuff, all those things will be really exciting. We'll pull them together and share them with everybody that's attended today. Um, and we'll have a look and see if you come up with any ideas about how we can take um, things forward. If it seems that there are some kind of research or practice gaps, um, one possibility from our side might be for NRI or FANCY to organise some kind of follow-up seminars or panels where we can um, take, you know, more of a kind of focus, longer approach and really start kind of digging into some um, areas. Um, there might be opportunities for um, perhaps looking at calls for, for future research and so on. So lots of um, kind of 
promising ideas and discussions. And I really feel we've just started, but it was been really, really um, exciting day. Again, thanks very much to everybody participating. Um, and Julie, I think you have a slider for everyone else that I'm going to thank. <laughs> Brilliant. So um, as I say, everybody coming today has made the most super you know, contribution, um, but particularly, um, I won't mention everybody by name, but a lot of people have been involved um, and um, people from NRI, I think, are on the kind of left-hand side there. So I'd like to say thank you to all of them and to our panel members. Again, thank you for taking time out to share your really exciting um, work and, you know, being honest, I think, and showing where the gaps are as well as the learning so far. I think we, I think food systems and obviously gender equity and diversity um, aren't always brought together, you know, directly in this way by this, you know, really super group of um, experts. And so I'd like to thank you for joining today. Um, and yeah, we'll be in touch. So thank you very much indeed. Bye now. <laughs>